Well, good morning. You can uh, find your way back to, uh, to your pew, and you can take your Bibles and, and turn open, or, or your digital devices, and turn to Judges chapter 4. We'll actually spend our whole time uh, focused on Judges chapter 4, but we're going to do some New Testament readings as well. And uh, just like last week, I'm going to have you do some reading. So hopefully uh, there are some of you that are brave enough. This week, we're, we're going to try it with a, micro, or with a, yeah, with a microphone uh, so that we can pick up your voices. There's some older folks that that maybe struggle a little bit or some that use a hearing device linked into our sound system so it's much easier for them to be able to hear if we can speak into a microphone. So this is what, what I'll need is uh, I will need somebody who maybe doesn't feel as comfortable reading but doesn't mind walking around with a microphone. Okay, So some of you need to be thinking am I brave enough to read? Okay, I'll be quick on the draw and I'll raise my hand when I'm asked and maybe one of you can just say I'll take the service just to wander around with a microphone and then I don't have to read and, uh, and it'll be good. So I'll, I'll ask for that in, a, in just a little bit. Uh, yeah, so let me let me just catch you up on a couple of things that Pastor Lindsay didn't mention about uh, this past week. We had our uh, annual general meeting on Thursday, and uh, it was probably the shortest meeting that, that I've been at in, uh, in recent history anyways. Um, but we got some things accomplished, so we elected two new members to our ministry council. Jason Radstake and Ken Tolman have both been elected. They will begin their term on December the 1st, which is when our new bylaws take effect. So if you're not part of the administration of our congregation, if you're somebody who's actively involved in ministries and come here on Sunday morning, uh, don't worry about it. It really doesn't affect you. But if you're interested in the administrative end of things and how we function and who's elected as positions of leadership, uh, the new bylaws, there's a few changes there. And so if you want more clarification, talk to a ministry council member or talk to me. Uh, but uh, you won't notice uh, much of a difference uh, if you're simply part of our ministries and you're a leader in, in that area. Um, it really largely affects uh, people that are, are in our administrative kind of leadership end of things. Uh, we also elected a finance team member. We elected a couple of discernment team members or our, like our nominating committee, the people that look around for the right people in the right positions. And so that, that's exciting as well. And we introduced our search team for our youth and families pastor. And so if you are a search team member, I'm going to invite you to stand. And I'm just going to pray for our, our search. It starts on Monday. And uh, that's, uh, that means that uh, things will go up online. And, and so if you know of anybody in, potentially interested in the position, uh, you can just tell them, uh, Google uh, Hanover Missionary Church, and you can go to our website. Uh, if somebody's interested and the, or if you're interested and you want a paper copy of uh, some of the things that we'll be uploading, uh, we can mo more than, we'd be more than happy to make that available. Just stop by and talk to Marie in our office. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I will say at this point. Um, so we'll be about a month. It'll be uh, open for about a month, uh, receiving resumes, and then our search team will begin to, uh, to um, um, try to find the right candidate. So search team members are, if you hear your name, uh, you can stand. Uh, the chairperson is Chris Winkles. If Chris is here, I don't know, maybe he's not. All right. Chris Winkles is our chair. Uh, our um, spokesperson, so uh, for kind of public announcements, will be Maggie Eddington, if Maggie's here. And uh, yes, there she is. Thanks, Maggie. And then we have, uh, as well, we have Brian Austin, who is, um, who is our clerk or our secretary, and he was here in first service. And then our ministry council members, who have been appointed to this committee, are uh, Paul West, Marcia Burt, and Ab Bogerman. So yes, we have Paul here and Marcia. So if you want more information, you want to talk to any one of these uh, members of the search team, there's only been one meeting so far, and so they may be able to answer a few questions. But, um, but yeah, if you're around these uh, search team members, why don't you stand and let's just pray for our search. And uh, if you just want to lay hands on the, per if you're near one of these ones, just lay your hands on them and, uh, and let's stand together and, uh, and we'll pray. Our Father, as we begin the search for uh, a, a youth and families pastor, Lord, uh, we know that you already have that, uh, that candidate in mind. And so, Lord, I pray that you would allow this process to be uh, one in which we as a congregation and as a search team and as a ministry council, uh, that uh, we, we, our confidence in you, Jesus, grows, um, that uh, it would be a, a process by which uh, we find uh, your wisdom and your discernment uh, leading us to the right candidate. And so, Lord, even for that candidate, speak to them right now uh, about, uh, about what, what it will mean to be part of our congregation. And Father, you know them. Uh, we may or may not know them, but Lord, we're going to trust that through this process, um, as we meet and interview candidates, Lord, that, um, that the spirit of peace, uh, the spirit of wisdom would rest uh, upon the search team and our whole congregation. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Well, I've been uh, doing some thinking and reflecting on the church, and there's a lot of changes that are happening in our society and our culture uh, when it comes to church and our understanding of church. And this, te- this actually, the, the scripture happens to be today's scripture in Judges chapter four. Uh, in my mind, happens to be a fairly clear picture of what the church is to be. And so, if you have your bulletins and you want to flip it over and you want to read that first line, the tent that offers hospitality and death. It may not be the most uh, uh, you may not understand it fully, but hopefully by the end you'll understand a little bit more. But I think that in itself is a great summary of what the church is actually supposed to be about. Okay, And if you substitute the church, the word tent for church, uh, we're well on our way to being what, what Jesus has actually called us to be. Now some of you are scratching your hands, you've already glanced through the scriptures and you're thinking, this is nuts. Uh, well, let's go there. Let's, let's learn together uh, what this particular text in Judges chapter 4 may have to do with our understanding of being the people of God and being the tent that uh, is hospitable and invites people to die. And uh, I would also say that uh, the church, if it's purely hospitable and there's no component of inviting people to death, uh, will, will not be a very biblical community, will not be a community in which people are actually being transformed by the good news of Jesus. Okay, And I would also argue a church that is exclusively exclusively about death <laughs> is not going to be very welcoming and warm and caring. It will be a place that you would, or, or a people that you would not want to really be a part of, okay? But you put those two seemingly incongruent things together and you get this beautiful picture of the church. And so that's that's where we're going to go today. And uh, so what I'll need is somebody who wouldn't mind carrying the microphone around. It's, it's on. All you have to do is be the carrier and uh, hand it to people and you may even, yeah, thanks Graham, if you wouldn't mind doing that. Thank you. Uh, All right, so here we go. Uh, Judges chapter 4 and verse 1. Somebody want to begin reading, and if you wouldn't mind, just like last week, we'll read through a chunk of text, and I will stop you along the way, and you'll continue on reading. Don't be afraid of the big words if you want to just pronounce the first few letters and move on. That's okay, too. We're not going to get hung up on that. So who would be courageous enough to be able to read a chunk and allow me to stop you along the way and, and intersperse some context and things? Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Cana, who reigned in Hazor. Good. Okay, let's just pause there. So, so what Karen's reading uh, right off the bat, if you were here last week, you know all about Ehud, the left-handed judge. He's a Benjamite. And largely what happens is in the book of Joshua, it's all about Israel as a whole. And it's all about them as a whole people group entering into the promised land, to this new land. And toward the middle and end of the book of Joshua, it's Joshua divvying up the various parts of the promised land to the different tribes, right? This tribe gets this, and this tribe gets this, and this tribe gets this over here. Okay? In the book of Judges, it's dealing mainly with individual tribes. So last week was the Benjamites, uh, uh, so Ehud was from them, and the wars that were taking place and the things that were happening were largely in the south. This week is actually about Naphtali and Ephraim, and they're more the northern tribes. Okay, So, so if you were to kind of um, take, the, take the lens, you kind of bring it out, and then we move it forward uh, kind of uh, north, uh, so uh, from the south to the north, and now we're zooming in on some of the things that are now going on in some of the northern northern tribes. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Continue on. The commander of his army was Caesarea, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. Good, good job, yeah. <laughs> because he had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Good, okay, so just pause there. So, uh, so we, we find the, the, the name of this commander, Sisera, or, or however Karen pronounced him, uh, uh, he is the commander of the armies of the Canaanites. And these are the ones that have oppressed Israel, and they had 900 iron chariots, and we know from earlier on, we know that the iron chariots posed Israel a particular challenge, even though God had promised... I will even drive out those with iron chariots. But nonetheless, Israel is once again enslaved by the Canaanites. They are under the thumb of them. And so they cry out to God and let's see what God then does. Thanks, Karen. Continue. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, 
was leading Israel at that time. Good. Now, here, so, sorry. This is the first example of a woman leading Israel at that time. And as I mentioned to you before, we're going to see a few women along the way that played really significant parts. In fact, there's another woman in this very chapter that's going to play a very significant role. And if you're interested, actually, uh, I'll come, go ahead, Karen. I'm getting ahead of myself. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramon and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. Good. So just pause there. Thanks, Karen. Uh, so here she's holding court, or she's um, she's sitting. I'm not sure what your translation says. Some of your translations may not say uh, holding court. They may say she would sit under, or she dwelt under this particular tree. It's a very similar phrasing as what we find in 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 2. And I won't ask you to turn there, but you can just jot that down. Where now we have Saul, the king of Israel, seated with 600 men under a pomegranate tree. Very similar situation. They're both seated under a, a, some sort of a tree and one's holding court or one's leading a group of 600. So if you're thinking of Deborah as just kind of sitting under a tree with a few people around her, uh, that's probably inaccurate. It's probably more, there's hundreds of people around her and she is sitting in a position of leader and judge and uh, the person who is charged with leading Israel at the time. So very significant role and, uh, and that's good. Okay, continue on Karen. She sent for Barak, son of Abimelech, uh, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. Good. Okay, so what she's doing is she's saying, God has called you, Barak. He's called you to deliver Israel. And so what you're going to do is you're going to go and you're going to take these, this army and you're going to lead them to Mount Tabor and you're actually going to lead them up the mountain. Okay? This is, it's, it's significant because God is actually giving him the, not only the what you're supposed to do, but the strategy behind why this is an important thing. Because remember, you're dealing with a nation of people who have lots of chariots. Okay? And I know we don't have chariots these days, but chariots in the plains were work really well. But when you start taking chariots up mountains, not so much, right? They don't work up in the mountains. So it's a great strategy that Deborah, on behalf of God, is taking to this one who God is calling to deliver Israel. It sounds like it's kind of, he's got it in the bag. No problem. Just do it and you're going to be victorious. Okay, continue on, Karen, please. I will to Cesera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Yeah, and remember, who's the I? Who's speaking here? This is God. Okay, God saying, I'm going to do this. This is not you. I'll lure them. You just go to the mountain. You just get up in the mountain and I'll take care of the rest. Good. Sounds like, it, sounds like it's in the bag, right? No problem. Yes, just say yes. And what does he say? Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, you know, mom... Will you, if you go with me, and then I'll do it, okay? Uh, uh, this is, this is a, a, a battle-ready man saying to a woman, and remember, please don't, I, I don't want to be uh, sexist. I, 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 uh, I believe in, in, uh, in all things to do with women and leadership and all of that. Uh, uh, but in this culture, uh, for a man to be saying to a woman, would you come with me? <laughs> I'm, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's not, uh, and Deborah's going to call him on it. And Deborah's, in uh, the, let's just go there so that it, they, it can say it and not me. Right. Very, well. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you, but because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Caesarea over to a woman. Yes, which is no problem, right? That sounds great, except in this culture, women were not particularly viewed as being strong leaders. And so, uh, so it's kind of this, this hey, if you're not going to trust God fully, then God will deliver the person into the hands of a woman. And by the way, at this point, we're probably thinking it's going to be Deborah that God will deliver the person into the hands of, and we're going to find out uh, whether whether it is Deborah or not. Good. You're doing a great job, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, keep going. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. 
10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Good. And Zebulon and Naphtali and Ephraim, they're all tribes. They're all one of those 12 tribes that, uh, that Israel is stationed. So they go, and they're, they're getting ready. Now, pretend like the lens of the camera is now zooming out, and we're getting a bit of backstory now, okay? Because this now little section in, in chapter uh, 4 and verse 11 is just a little more insider context that's being provided for us. So, so now forget a little bit of what we just heard. Now it's a totally different storyline that's developed. Developing. Okay, go ahead. Now Heber the Kenite was left with uh, the other Kenites and des the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zenanim near Kadesh. Good, okay, so now we have a Kenite, uh, uh, and his name is, um, is Heber, and if we find out that he left the Kenites in order to go pitch his tent near a tree, all right? Oh, there's a lot we can say about this, uh, but uh, let me just uh, figure out what to say. If you have the King James Version, uh, your version would say something about, uh, he, in, in terms of leaving the Kenites, he severed himself from the Kenites, okay? Now, the Kenites are the people that are originally living in that land. They had kind of settled the land, and uh, Israel has a bit of a strange relationship with them in, in the earlier part of the book of Judges. It seems as though Israel was kind of cozy with the Kenites, which may or may not be a good thing, but we find later on in this text that the Kenites were actually quite good friends and cozy with the Canaanites, okay? Now, remember, the Canaanites are the ones who oppress, are oppressing Israel, so we're not quite sure how to think about this, but all we need to think about at this moment in time is the fact that there's Kenites. One family has left that group. They separated themselves from that group and they've pitched their tent uh, essentially at the foot of a tree. Okay, they're, they're living under a tree or near a great tree. And again, in the King James Version, there isn't even a tree. It says something about a plain. Your New Living Translation probably says something about an oak, which is bizarre. I don't understand. It's clearly a tree. And uh, so, uh, so let's, let's continue on. Uh, verse 12. When they told Caesarea that Barak, son of Abimoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Caesarea gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him from Herosheth Hagayim to the Kishon River. Good. Okay, so they're gathering their army, and we don't know who the they is that told uh, Sisera and, and that army um, that Israel is gathering their troops, but nonetheless, uh, they, uh, they know about it, uh, and so they're going to fight. Okay, the chariots, they're m marching to the mountain, and the Israelites are stationed in the mountain at the, at the, uh, they're, they're on higher ground, and let's find out what happens in verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go. This is the day the Lord has given Caesarea into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. As at Barak's advance, the Lord routed Caesarea and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Caesarea abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Herosheth Hagoyim, all the troops of Caesarea fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Good. All right. So here we have uh, uh, Israel taking over the army of the Canaanites. And we see uh, uh, Caesarea actually uh, uh, running away. He's fleeing. Now we see them actually coming to his hometown, right? That, that strange term that uh, um, the Herosheth Hegoyim is actually the hometown of Caesarea. And yet he ends up running away. And we're going to find out now where he runs to. So basically, Basically, his whole army is defeated. All of those 900 chariots, the, the people riding the chariots, the army, they're defeated. They've been given over to the hands of Israel, except one commander who runs away. And where does he go? Verse 17. Caesarea, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Good. So let's just pause. Remember this? Remember who this family is? This is the family that left the Kenites, and they are now living by themselves near a tree or near an oak, and it just so happens that uh, Caesarea ends up making his way to that tent. Because there were friendly relations between Jabin king of Hazor and the clan of Heber the Kenite. Good, okay, so the Canaanite king is friends with the Kenites and with this, uh, uh, um, uh, with this, with this clan, okay, with the people that are living 
in this tent. All right, verse 18. Jael went out to, make, to meet Caesarea and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what, now typically in this society, it's the man who extends the hospitality, okay? We don't know where the man is. We don't know where Heber is. He's maybe not there. We don't know. All we see is Jael, his wife, running out to say, Come. And it's actually almost like a musical, uh, it's like a musical, um, uh, those word, the wording is, is almost like a musical, it's like music. Let's say that. <laughs> I don't know. That's what it is, all right? So, so depending on your translation, yours might say uh, uh, something to the effect of, um, uh, it might say something to the effect of, uh, I've lost my place. See, I'm just following along with what you're saying, having a good time, and now I don't know where I am in the sermon. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Turn aside, my Lord. Turn aside to me. Do not fear, okay? So she's saying, come, or turn aside. Come, I, I welcome you. It's, it's an extension of hospitality. Come, I, I see you're in distress. I see you're having some, some, some challenges. I don't know what they are. But come, and don't be afraid. You can come in, okay? Good. Thanks, Karen. Continue. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. Yeah, okay. So not only come, but let me cover you, right? Let me, let me take care of you. Here, lie down and rest. And it's this beautiful, I said this already, but hospitality. Good. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Yeah, so uh, I'm thirsty. Not only does she get n not give him water, she gives him milk. She gives him something even better than water, okay? Something that's actually going to nourish him. And, uh, and so she gives him the milk, and then she covers him again. And of course, I mean, you're exhausted. You're feeling like this wonderful hospitality. Uh, uh, she welcomes him, and of course, he's, he's going to go to sleep. But before he does this, what does he say? Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. Yeah, okay, so we need to pause here, okay? So he's just giving her some instructions, we, you know, just, just stand at the door, and if the New International Version, I think that's what you're reading from, is saying, if anyone comes and, and says, is anyone in your tent, say no, okay? Now, the King James, I think, captures it really well, because it's not an anyone and if someone, okay? It's specific gender. There's a specific gender uh, spoken of here. Who has the uh, the the, the King James Version that wouldn't mind reading that out. Just King James, and we are now speaking of verse 20 of chapter 4. Okay, just, we're going to come back to Karen. Just somebody with a King James Version. Somebody have one of those? Karen, you have one? No. Oh, oh okay, sorry. Yes, over here, here's one. Yeah. Oh, okay, here we go. Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come. And okay, t time out, Josh. Thanks. If any man doth come, okay, it's gender specific. If a man comes, okay, go ahead, Josh. When any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, is there any man here? Yeah, okay, if a man comes and says, is there a man in the house? You get that? Like, is there a man here? What are you supposed to say? That thou shalt say no. No, there's no man here. Okay, do you get that? Do you get the kind of, you know, he's, he's welcomed in by a woman. He's just let his whole army uh, be defeated. He's cowering in fear. And he's, uh, he's not a man's man. Okay, no, there's no man here. I don't have to lie about that. Okay, now not only there's this aspect of, of this kind of sense of, yeah, right? Like, yeah. Not sure about being a man, right? There's, so there's that, there's that play that's happening there, but there's also this dynamic of what she's about to do, recognizing and acknowledging, though no, actually there's no man, there's no woman, there's nobody in here that's alive, okay? So there's a sense in which he doesn't know this, but she's about to do something that will make sure that, no, there is no man here. Okay, so let's, let's continue on, Karen. Thank you. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. Yeah, okay, so he's just, I mean, the battle, he's running for his life, he's terrified, he's afraid, he's got, he's got milk, he's laying down, he's covered up, he's exhausted, and he falls asleep, right? And so JL, okay, let's, let's move on to the next. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Yes, yeah, yeah, so uh, what a beautiful picture of the church, right? <laughs> I mean... This extension of hospitality and this driving the tent peg into the temple. All right, let's be careful. Follow.
follow, this is context, right? Follow me all the way to the end here. Don't, don't just get up and, and go now. Uh, let's, let's talk. Good. And so we see, thanks, Karen. And so we see, uh, essentially, that's the turning point. Then Barak comes to the, to the tent, says, is there anyone here? And uh, she says, yeah, he's, he's dead. Uh, um, uh, I'll show you him. He's dead. And, uh, and there, there it is. And so Israel actually turned, this turns the tide. Israel gains the upper hand. And, uh, and it's, it's, a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful life at this point. All right, let's look specifically. I want to, I want to talk to you about the tent, number one uh, of your outline, uh, because I, we need to make some connections here, right? All we see in this story is there's a tent. There are people that have left their people group, and they've come and they've, they've pitched a tent under a tree or near a tree, okay? Uh, in the New Testament, the most famous, uh, sorry, the Old, Old Testament and New Testament, the most famous tent is the tabernacle. Now, in the, uh, in the uh, Old Testament Hebrew, the word tent, there's no different word between a tent where people dwell and the tent of the tabernacle, the, 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 the basically the, um, the, the place where God and by his spirit would dwell within the Ark of the Covenant and there's a whole temple, there's a whole tabernacle system. All right? So in the Old Testament, it's the same word and uh, what we see is just like the two-edged sword of last week, we took note and went, mm, there's a two-edged sword being, uh, being used here. Is there a New Testament interpretation that we can read back into this to see that there may be actually, um, there may be clarity that we, we have on this text uh, from a New Testament perspective, okay? So it's an interesting story, but are there things for us to learn as New Testament people in terms of uh, what might be going on here? And yes, in terms of the tent, we need to focus on the tent and look at what's significant about these people that left, that separated themselves from their people, and they went and they dwelt at the foot of, uh, of a tree uh, uh, out uh, away from their people. Uh, there's clear parallels between the tent of the Old Testament and what we read in John, uh, John chapter 1 and verse 14. Okay, so if somebody would, wouldn't mind just looking that one up. John chapter 1, and there's going to be a few New Testament references here. No scary names in here. And Karen, you did such a really uh, really good job on reading that Old Testament text. New Testament text, there aren't going to be any scary names. Who would read 1 John chapter 1 verse 14? 1 John chapter 1 verse 14. I'm sorry, John chapter 1 verse 14. Wow. John, the Gospel of John. So the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory and the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Good. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, the Word became flesh. So the beginning of the Gospel of John, it starts just like Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. Instead of in the beginning, God created. It was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's this, there's this, there's this insight in terms of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Except before, before it's Jesus, uh, there is the Word. And so the Word actually separates himself in some ways from the other two, uh, 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 from the Father and the Spirit, in order to take on flesh. And what does it say? Bruce's translation said, and made his home, okay? Or some of your translations may say, and dwelt among us, or made his dwelling among us. This is that, back in the Old Testament term, of tabernacled, of dwelt, of tent, okay? There it is again. That now we have God himself coming and dwelling among us uh, in the same way that we have this term tent. Uh, so basically, he pitched his tent, he tabernacled, he dwelt among us, okay? So, what does this separation then have to do with it? See, because not only do we see Jesus, uh, uh, in a sense, living in a way that's, uh, that's apart from the Godhead for a season, he actually then calls his people to that same kind of separateness, okay? So what happens is, is that Jesus comes and dwells, and then Jesus says, hey, now that I'm leaving, so he's now lived and he's about to be crucified, and now that I'm leaving, now I'm giving my mandate to you, and you're going to become the church. Church, okay, and the church. I'm not going to use the same term, the tabernacle or or, or dwelling. We're going to use the term temple for the church, right? But what is a temple? Well, it's the Old Testament tabernacle where David said, "Hey, God, you don't deserve to just dwell in a tent that gets moved around. We want to make a, 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 a space for you that's actually made of something other than just removable parts." So they made a temple in Solomon's day. Okay, so from then on, we have temple imagery. We have this dwelling of God is in the temple and then Jesus comes and reframes it and says, not only am I the, the temple or the tabernacle, 
Uh, but I'm actually calling people to be that. Okay, so 2 Corinthians is a significant text. If we can read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, this speaks of this separation. Just like the Kenites, they separated themselves and they came to dwell underneath the tree. Uh, uh, now here we have uh, the people of God called to be separate. This, the called out ones is actually a literal terminology of the church. Okay? So 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 16 to 17. Who would like to read that with the microphone too? We do want to be sensitive to those that, that uh, have hearing challenges. Thanks Josh. And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Okay, just pause for a second, Josh. Did you hear that? We are the temple, okay? We are the dwelling of God, okay? We are the tent of God, if you will. Continue, Josh. As God said, I will live, among, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. Good. That's good. Thanks, Josh. So what, what is God saying? He's saying, you are my temple, okay? In me, you have become my dwelling place, and I want you to separate yourself from unbelievers. Now, in case you were tempted to just think, oh, that means we need to isolate ourselves, we need to kind of batten down the hatches because we're afraid of interacting with people who are unbelievers, that's actually not at all what it's saying. In Ephesians, this is an important text, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 through 22, let's just read that. If somebody would would, would uh, grab that and just raise your hand as you find that one. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 to 22. We read parts of this actually last week, but it's important just to read it again, just to gain some clarification. Yep, over here. Heather. He brought this good news of peace to you. Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the name of the Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Good. So just pause there for a second, Heather. So what, what Paul is saying in this text is there's Jews and Gentiles, and there's a big problem because neither wants to associate with the other. And what Christ has done is he's actually brought peace to those two groups. Okay, continue on, Heather. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Good, thank you. Okay, so we see this great example of Christ is the cornerstone. And on top of Christ is the apostles and the prophets. And there's Jews and Gentiles actually being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives. There it is again. There's that term. There's that idea. We are a grand tent, an ever-growing tent that is the place where God dwells. Okay, now in case we're tempted to think, well, that tent actually needs to make sure that we don't interact with unbelievers, or don't, those that don't believe the same as us, or those that don't trust Christ as their Savior, remember that actually Christ came to bring peace, right? And it's in the midst of that, that, that God's house is growing ever more fully. And so what are we called to be separate from? We're called to be separate from living the lives that those who don't believe in Jesus would live. We're called to not live like them or act like them. We're called to live as Christ being our center, and out from which we derive our understanding of ourselves and our calling and of our worth instead of allowing the God of this world to, to tell us who we are and what we should be doing and what we value and why we are valuable. Okay, so it's, it's in this perspective that here we have this tent pitched. And Jesus pitched it deliberately in a separate kind of way to say, I'm not pitching the tent of my temple just anywhere. I'm pitching it outside. You know what? I'm going to be deliberate to pitch it right at the foot of a tree. And in the New Testament, the tree is the cross. 
And it's there, it's at the foot of the cross that Christ actually pitches his tent of the church and says, that's where you get your understanding from. It's right from that tree. And it's at the foot of the cross that you begin to understand the peace that I've brought, that I've offered myself in, 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 in forgiveness for you. And I've given myself to death because you deserved it and I didn't. But I love you and I want you to be part of my family. And in fact, in John chapter, you can jot this down, it's a fascinating text. John chapter 19 verses 25 to 27. We see Jesus on the cross and at the foot of the cross, there's his mom and some other women and there's his disciples. And he says to his mom, Mom, this is now your son. And he says to John, John, this is now your mother. Talk about the church. There it is. Christ on the cross. Christ giving himself, saying, let me tell you how to be a family. It's not just about bloodlines anymore. It's about in me, you are now. So you're all mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers to each other. And you're all called to bring other people into that. And we're going to get into this hospitality aspect of what the church is to be calling, to be, to be running out like JL and saying, come, come, we'll take care of you. And there it is, at the foot of the cross. And we see in Ephesians chapter 2, if Heather was to read just a little bit earlier, uh, it would say, in this body, in the Christ's physical body, he reconciled both of them, Jews and Gentiles, to God through the cross. See, without the cross, the church is just a social gathering. It's just a, you know, we, we like to talk about Jesus and what he's done, but we don't really understand what the suffering of Christ actually brought about for me. We don't really understand the depths of our sin and how it's our sin that hung him there. And we don't understand what it is to then live out of our lives in the freedom of, of knowing that Christ has actually paid for it all. That's what the cross is for the church. Uh, so there's this beautiful, intimate connection between the church and the cross and what Christ has done, what Christ is establishing now in us as he's now in a different place. He's no longer on the cross, but he's calling us saying, this is your mother and this is your son. And he's calling people into community with him, saying, you are to be a family and I'm calling you to love each other. Well, what does that offer? So we have the tent. We see what the tent is. We see the tent stationed at the cross, the, the tent of the church. And what does the offer? Well, one is fairly appealing, and the other is actually something that if we're, if we're not careful, we can actually run away from. And so if we go back to Judges chapter 4, verse 18, we see this woman calling out, saying, Come, my Lord. Come right in. Don't be afraid. Come. It's actually a little translation. Come to me. Come to me. Okay, does that remind you of someone saying that? In Matthew chapter 11, where in verse 28, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We see this image of Jael running up from the tent. We see this image of Jesus saying, Come to me. If you're weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come, come in. Come in to me, and I will come into you. Come into my house, my tent. Come into my church, where you will find rest and peace in me and in my name. We have this beautiful uh, imagery of hospitality. And then what happens? Well, we see uh, she covered him. She gave him a drink. She protected him. Does that remind you of something that Jesus has called the church to be about? Not only running, saying, come, come, bring your burdens. But also to be saying, come, how can we take care of you? Matthew 25 is the next text we're going to read. Who would like to read Matthew 25, verses 31 to 36? Matthew 25, 31 to 36. Just raise your hand and Graham will bring the microphone. Thanks, Al. <clears throat> when the Son of the Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and I gave you and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Good. 
Thanks, Al. And it goes on to talk about the inverse of that. Okay? So Jesus is saying, I was, when you welcomed in the stranger, when you welcomed in the one needing, uh, needing a drink, when you welcomed in the naked one, you were welcoming in me. And that's what I'm calling the church to be about. To welcome in people and to help them and to offer them something. Because there's all kinds of people in the world that are fleeing, trying to figure out, what do I do now? I'm, I don't even know what, what's going on with my life. And some people are in that place and other people don't recognize that they're in that place. But when they come, we run out to greet them. And even while they're on the way, we run out to greet them and we welcome them in and we welcome them and we offer them hospitality. And then something strange happens. See, because into that community, and that's, that's a beautiful picture of a community welcoming people that are hurting and in need. But into that community, the day comes when the tent peg comes out. And see, sometimes if we're, not, if we're not careful, we may simply be striving to be a community that, that, that it just does really good things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the question is, are we also a community that says, you know, in this community, the expectation is that you die. Okay? Now, if you're not familiar with the biblical text, I, I'm not talking about physical death. Okay? I'm not talking about uh, there is, you know, when you're welcomed into mem membership, there comes a day when you, you know, that's why none of our members are over the age of 50 or whatever it may be. Okay? <laughs> But in Christ, in the New Testament, there's a very clear picture, not only of welcoming in the stranger, of caring for a hurting world and people, but there's an expectation that as you are welcomed in, in the name of Christ, that you are also welcomed in to put your life down, to lay your life down. And here's some scriptures in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. It says, take up your cross and follow me. Because if you want to lose your life, you'll find it. And if you want to gain your life, you're actually going to lose it. So if you want to actually know what life is all about, you put your life on the line. Romans chapter 12 reminds us, it says, you become a living sacrifice. That is your holy and acceptable form of worship. There's no such thing as a sacrifice that's not dead. But what Paul is referencing is not a physical death so much as a death to yourself, to your ways, to your will, to the things that you think uh, are important in life. They are on the altar before God and you allow your mind to be changed and transformed by Christ himself. And Christ can't do very much with somebody who is welcoming in, saying, come, welcome, I want to help. I want to serve. I want to love you. But is not laying their lives on the line. And not saying, Jesus, I'm allowing you to put me to death. Some of us, we, we're good at one and not the other. Galatians chapter 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about a people, a church, that knows not only how to welcome the stranger, but knows how to die to themselves knows how to say, it's no longer about me. And so what does it look like for us to walk in relationship with each other where we're trying to learn how to die to ourselves? Not how to put other people to death, okay? That's, that's where, you know, certainly we're not like JL. That's, that's the work of Christ, okay? It's not up to us to say, oh, you need to die to yourself and, you know, you're a wretched, wretched sinner. Uh, no, it's up to us to say, Jesus, would you put me to death? Uh, would you, in your caring for me, in your clothing me, would you then put me to death so that what comes from within me as my life is resurrected in Christ, what comes from me is love and peace and joy and patience. And it's not something that happens immediately. It's not something that happens overnight. But those who are learning to die to their selfish ways are being resurrected in Christ to become new people. Other scriptures say this in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Paul says, May I never boast except in the cross through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, that I'm no longer living for the values that I see around me. I'm living for Christ and Christ alone. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, there's another scripture you can jot down. Colossians 3, it's, it's everywhere. Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Worship team, why don't you come? And I encourage you that you would be someone 
who begins at the cross, that we would be a congregation that begins at the cross. We pitch our tent, our congregation, at the foot of the cross, and we'd say it's through the death of Christ that we find forgiveness and healing and reconciliation and hope. And maybe some of us, that's the place we start today, is in the cross. And once we come face to face with the cross, we are able to run out and welcome people in and say, come, come, find rest, don't be afraid, come, and we welcome them in, and in the midst of that, we find ourselves dying to our selfish ways, dying to what the world has to offer in order to live a life that Christ is bringing forth from us. Let's stand and sing. Graham, if you could put, uh, this is amazing, Grace, up on the screen. So maybe you are like Sisera and you are running for your life and you are exhausted and you're confused and you need a place to call home. And Jesus says, I welcome you. And our community says, we welcome you. Come, come in, don't be afraid. And maybe you're lying dead in this community. And Jesus says, why don't you go and welcome people and clothe them and uh, bind up the brokenhearted and why don't you begin to, to get up off the floor and begin to welcome people in and do all those things. And maybe you're someone who's so busy welcoming, gaining your value and your worth that Jesus is saying, come and die. Because when you die, you will live. And I will raise you up and you can trust me. But will you come and die so that I can make you all that much more full as my follower, as my disciple? Lord, we thank you. As a community, we are gathered in your name, in your name alone. Jesus, thank you for this image, this picket picture of the church, the tent, in which we welcome people and we ourselves are being put to death and we're welcoming them into being cared for and putting them to death in your name. Jesus, I pray that our death would lead to a life of resurrection that has implications in our communities, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. That we would be recognized as being people who are selfless, who are loving, who are patient, who are kind, who are welcoming. And yet people who are not afraid to die to Christ, in Christ, die to the world. And so thank you, oh God. Thank you for the image of the church. Thank you for the relationships we have in you. Thank you for the freedom that's found in you that we can relate to each other no matter where we're from. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.